Hello, welcome to Life Questions. I'm Bill Harris, your host. As the title implies, this program focuses on questions that we all have about life. And you know, life presents many challenges, out of which grow many questions that are begging to be answered. But as well, the answers you could find, the best answers that you could find to any of your questions are those with a biblical perspective. That is, answers that are provided to us from the Word of God. We have received a number of thoughtful questions from you, our home audience, and we've assembled a panel of ministers to address those concerns. So today, as we get into the program, I want you to meet our invited guests. And we begin with Pastor Jonathan Hanover of the Kenton First United Methodist Church. Then there's Pastor Angie Chung of the Delphus First Assemblies of God, followed by Pastor Nathan Branham of Grace Fellowship Church, and to round up our panel, Pastor Chris Ewing of the County Line Church of the Brethren. And again, as I said a little bit later on, we're going to be uh, giving you information on how you can send us your questions, so make sure that you stay tuned. Meantime, let's get right into our discussion. And I think the thing that is uppermost on everybody's minds is the, the tragic shootings that have occurred in um, Dayton, Ohio, and in El Paso, Texas. Uh, the big question that's that's just blanketing this country is why? Why? Why such tragedy? And how, how do we deal with it? Where do we go from, from here? What is the biblical perspective on tragedies like this? And, and obviously, this is not the first time. We've, we've got a litany of these. Uh, what, what's the biblical perspective that we can offer to people across this country? Well, Bill, I, I think whenever you're asking questions uh, to God about why tragedy, why suffering, uh, you're talking about a branch of theology uh, called theodicy, and that's made up of two words, theos God and DK, uh, justice. So if there is a just God, why are we seeing all of this injustice? And furthermore, if we have a God who is just and loving, why all of this, this nonsensical tragedy? And uh, this is a question that has plagued humanity since the beginning. And the, the answer that we can go to is from the scriptures, and that is the book of Job. I, I call it the sufferer's handbook. And we know that it's a valid book, even though it be in the Old Testament. Uh, James 5.11 says that the prophets are examples of how to handle, handle suffering. The next verse says that Job is a promise to those that suffer, that in the end, God is gracious. And so anytime that we're, we're answering the question, it is imperative that we answer the question why properly. Mm -hmm. Many have not, and they have defected from the faith. One person that uh, comes to mind is Bart Ehrman. He's a New Testament scholar mm -hmm. uh, down in Raleigh, Durham, I believe. And at one time uh, was a, a vibrant believer, but because of his perceived injustice of the world and God's apparent laxity to carry out justice, mm -hmm he defected from the faith. So now he is embittering people against the faith that he once held mm. because he failed to answer the question why properly. Not that he failed to answer it, because we all answer it, mm -hmm. but are you going to answer it properly? And I think the only way that we answer it properly is through faith. Meaning what? I mean, how do, you, how, sure. how do you define faith in that context? I think it's important that we don't project the character of man as the character of God. Ah. And I think that a lot of times men and women have taken upon themselves to solve the problems in the world, which has led them to a hopeless solution. So we try to do things in our own way of thinking. So we and limit God to our own limitations as human beings? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, no matter what answer you give to someone who asks why, no answer is ever going to satisfy their why. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do believe that the church needs to be outside of the church being the church. Um, hmm, very well put. So church needs to be outside of the church. Being, being the, church, the church, representing who God is. Mm -hmm. Not who we need God to be, not who we perceive God is, but looking at the absolute truth of his word, communicate, proclaim who he actually is. A God of love, a God of mercy, a God who is moved with compassion because of the needs of people, but a God whose heart is moved based on the effective, fervent prayers of righteous people. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to we need to go back to, you know, God is not a sugar daddy just to meet your need for today. He wants to change your life and prepare you for eternity. Mm -hmm. And so I think when the church reacclimates itself to the needs of society, that's what's going to control the violence is bringing value to life based on the God who we serve. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, just a, one more thing that I think is imperative. 
uh, everyone will answer the question why. They will answer it. They'll ask it and then they'll answer it. There's really only a right and a wrong. There's one or the other. And I know that that, that could be perceived as flattening, flattening the substantive issue. But let me just say, the wrong answer is to doubt God. The right answer is to believe that God is working all things together for good. Mm -hmm. That is the story of Job. That is the story of every righteous sufferer that has ever suffered. Uh, so Paul, who, who suffered tremendously, says this, our light affliction, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our light affliction, and now this is coming from a man who was imprisoned, beaten, mm -hmm. shipwrecked, mm -hmm. all of these things, mm -hmm. our light affliction. Well, how is, it, how is it light affliction? You said it, Pastor, our perspective. Right. If we're only seeing tragedy and these things from human perspective, we'll always fail, but let me finish this out. Our light affliction is but for a moment, that it's working for us a far more exceeding and greater weight of glory. We don't look to the things that are temporal, but to the things that are eternal. And that, that is how you answer it correctly. And as you wait in faith and say, God, I believe that you can take out of this tragedy gold that could never come out any other way. Uh, here's, I think, the proper perspective at the end of the day, and, and I have term this, I've called it the believer's uh, cross theodicy. That is any tragedy, you pass it through the crucifixion of Jesus. Out of the greatest human tragedy, we crucified love. We murdered love. Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not. We crucified it and watch what God did. Mm -hmm. God took the single great, greatest, wickedest act in all of human history and out of it, was born the greatest good. That is the power of God. And I think at the end of the day, that's how we have to answer the question, why? Yeah. I think the, I was, go ahead, I have perspective. I think the question of why, as you say, is it's a dead end because we think that why will give us peace, hmm. but it won't really give us Absolutely. peace. How many things do we know the why to and we still don't, we still struggle we still with wonder, it. Right? And I think you can go back to the question that God asks of Jonah at the end of Jonah when he says, is it right that you're angry over this? And mm -hmm. if you want to literally translate it in Hebrew, is, is it right that this is consuming you? And so that question of why can consume us, but it doesn't ultimately lead to any sort of peace. You know, what God promises is a peace that goes beyond understanding um, because our understanding is enough. We mm -hmm. think it will be. And, you know, we've read the end of the book. Spoiler alert. <laughs> we know that God wins <laughs> at the end of this <laughs> and life can bring terrible tragedies. Right. But really that the worst this life can do to us at the end, mm. God already holds the keys well, to the, life and death. The one thing we haven't addressed is, is we're trying to answer the question of why would God allow this? <laughs> but we haven't asked, um, entertained the aspect of free will yet because you know, God did not, does not micromanage his creation. He set things into order and allows things to run as, as we, as all, over all of creation, um, deem it. So when evil people wanna do evil things, they will have the free will to do that. I don't think the question so much is, is why would God allow this that needs to be answered? It's more of coming back to what you were saying is, is how does the church really respond mm -hmm. to it? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we, you know, talk, and just like we were talking a little bit beforehand, you know, about the, the prayer thing um, and how a lot of people are saying, you know, no more prayers because it's not working. Mm -hmm. We've used prayer that as, as basically saying, how are you now? Like when we introduce somebody, how are you doing? I don't really care how you're doing. I did, that's just something we say, yeah, because if I yeah. really want to know how you're doing, I want to sit down with you and we're going to have a conversation that's going to be at least a half hour, if not longer, right? Mm -hmm. The prayer is perceived as weakness yes. in some cases for some people. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, hey, I got something, well, I'll pray for you. Do you really stop right then and there and pray for them? Do you actually write it down and come to, you know, before the throne of God at night before you do your prayer or anything? Probably not. That's just a comment that we make. And so what the world is seeing is, is saying, well, all these prayers aren't working because people are just saying, well, prayers. You know, you get on Facebook and you put, well, prayers and thoughts to you. Well, yeah, probably thoughts, but you're not praying. Right. You know, it's something that I had to teach myself as a pastor when I say, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Well, I know myself really well. And I know if I don't pray for you right then and there, I'm not praying for you. That's just, that's just because the reality. You move on to because, yeah, else. my mind is, is filled with everything else. So I try and stop right then and there. We're going to pray, even if it's just a short, you know, one to five minute prayer and pray. So the, re, the aspect of the question of over these tragedy is not so much of why would God allow this, but how are the people of God? 
going to respond to right. this. Because I think that distracted, distracted desperation leads to destruction. And people are desperate to find meaning and purpose for their life. And I think there's a reason why Paul writes in Hebrews, fix your eyes on Jesus. Yes. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Do not be distracted from your creator, from the purpose, mm -hmm. from who he made you to be, from the fact that he loves you. And so we have all of these people who are distracted by cell phones, distracted by computers, distracted by TV, distracted by hobbies, students who are distracted by Fortnite. They're distracted by all of these things, which leads them to a place where they might feel abandoned by God because mm -hmm. they're not spending time keeping their eyes fixed on him. And I love the saying, um, the devil makes easy prey of people who feel like they've been abandoned by God. Because yeah, yeah. you haven't been abandoned by God, but if he can create that mind trick in your mind that you feel abandoned, you're gonna go into protective mode and pull yourself away from the closeness that God desires to have with each one of us. And I think that's good counsel, particularly for somebody that has a history uh, of a relationship with God. What do you do for that person that's um, uh, a survivor victim of either one of these shootings right now that mm -hmm. doesn't know God, mm -hmm. Without speaking in Christianese right. language, how do you reach that person to let them know that you know, God just didn't allow this to happen and God loves you despite of this? How do you reach out to that person? I think you reach out to them with honesty. Say, mm -hmm. I don't know why God allowed this to happen. I don't know why God allowed this to happen, but I also think God's word says we can comfort anyone in whatever situation they are in if we have allowed ourselves to be comforted in the situations we have been in. So I think you walk alongside of them. I don't think it's a time to preach a five point That's sermon good. into their life. Yeah. No. You have to love them, walk with them, hurt with them, cry with them, um, and leave the judgment to the side. You can talk mm -hmm. about you know, what God wants to maybe do in their life and you know, how he wants to work it together for the good, you can do all of that later. They need comfort. They need mm -hmm. a community. They need a friend. Mm -hmm. And maybe God wants you to be that bridge between him and that person through your friendship and comfort. And I've often noticed that when a person needed heal in, in the time of Jesus on earth, and when a person needed healing and the like, sometimes before he dealt with their spiritual tragedy, trauma, whatever it was, he fed them or he, he did yes. something that needed to be done in the natural. And that drew that individual to Christ. Yes. Uh, look at the way he dealt with a woman who was caught in adultery. And he didn't, he didn't say that, no. na, 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 naughty, naughty, naughty. You know, he dealt with her as a person. And she was in trouble. Mm. It was the Sanhedrin mm -hmm. that had brought that woman mm -hmm. to Jesus. And she should have been mm -hmm. stoned, according to right. the law. When well, you're exactly right, like, God already gave us the example. Right. Uh, we have it right here. You know, we need to follow Jesus, what Jesus had did. But then Paul also goes on and, you know, tells us, hey, he's given us more than just the example. He's actually given us the abilities to do these things. And so my mind goes to the church is already equipped through those that are gifted in, in their spiritual gifts. So this is a perfect opportunity for those that are gifted in mercy. You know, because, because they can go, I, I don't have the gifting of mercy. And I tell my, my congregation this all the time. We laugh about <laughs> it, but, but you know, I love walking people and sharing Jesus Christ with them and, and walking them to a point of salvation. But a mercy person will go into the depths of where they are at in the worst scenario. And even though the hurts don't change, they will take them to a point where they can 100% have a fantastic relationship with Jesus Christ, serve him with his full much ability, but none of those hurts are gone. I mean that, you know, you lost your husband a year ago. Your husband, he's not coming back, mm -mm. but God was able to take you from that standpoint mm -hmm. to still being able to pastor a church, mm -hmm. not just dropping out of ministry and, and wallowing right. in that self-pity, mm -hmm. right. but gifted people can surround. You testify that you do that after you lost your wife, mm -hmm. that you see that and now you are gifted in the ability to help men that lose their wife, mm -hmm. not, fix the tragedy, right. but to take them through the tragedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so the church is equipped to address these mass shootings with the gifts that God has already given us, the examples that he has laid out for us in his word, to mm -hmm. go to them and walk with them, as you has pointed out. Not to go, shame, shame, it's because of all these things that this, it's, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I think you're the so The love right. of God mm -hmm. matters. Let, let, let's pause for now, we're gonna take a break, but when we come back, I, I'd like to deal with the fact that the church 
has a definite mandate to minister to this world. Yes. And uh, how, how that breaks down in, in the 21st century here. We'll be right back right after this. Don't go away. More good discussion to come. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and we're grappling with biblical perspective on these tragedies, these recent tragedies that have occurred in Dayton, Ohio, and El Paso, Texas. L let me just say this, and I don't say this as a put down, but as total encouragement. The church is the greatest institution ever, ever created, the greatest institution on this earth. What organization, what, what institution can you name whereby the gates of hell cannot come up against it and, 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 and conquer it, right. you know? And we have to understand, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And so, but what happens, is, even in the midst of tragedy, we as Christians sometimes take sides when God called us to take over. Mm. We're here to take over and, and with the love of God, you know? Why isn't that happening, even in the midst of this tragedy? Why aren't we taking to the microphones in news conferences to give a biblical perspective? Why aren't we moving in with the clothes and the foods and the warm pat on back, the backs and the hugs and, and telling people God, God loves you? Why aren't we not visible in this time? I think we are, we're cons if we're a church that's marked by our concern with suffering, but we don't go further and be known by our concern for suffering and eternity, I think that's the problem. And I think a lot of times churches want to meet the social need, but not go further, because meeting the social need is something that makes us comfortable. And as humanity, we want to live a life that's comfortable, but we're serving a savior whose life was anything but uncomfortable. <laughs> so we hesitate to make those same sacrifices. Mm -hmm. um, and then we wonder, you know, why the church isn't visible. It's because we are hiding within our buildings. I think we have to get out. We have to walk alongside of people. Can't see beyond the stained glass windows. Right. Well, I think we've lost a battle. Um, you know, love is not always loving, right? That's I mean, so how true. we define it. Yeah, that's true. You know, sometimes love is being harsh. Um, but, you know, with everything over, over the course of, of history within our country has tried to push the church out of things and I mean we can define it as whatever but you know the whole separation of church and state and you know well the postmodern movement you can't tell me you know what's good for you mm -hmm. is is not necessarily good for me and what's right for you isn't right for me and all those things that it's really chipped away at one biblical authority and is there an absolute truth um, and all those things which then well, when, when a hard situation comes in, well, I can't tell you, I'm sorry, you know, because I have to be loving and, and to be loving isn't telling you the truth. It's, it's making you feel good. Mm. Um, you know, so from my perspective, it's, it's the fact that we have not stood up for righteousness as a church, right. you know, and for the true things and to cause those hard times so that the good times can follow because sometimes you need to go through the muck in order to, order, in order to enjoy the promised land on the other side. Um, Jesus made it extremely easy for us to have eternal life with him, to have um, an internal love from him, but yet we still need to accept it. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't just say, well, you have it, you have it, you have it, you have it. We have it. We just need to take grasp of it. But we expect people just to automatically have it without them taking the step to grasp it. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it from our aspect as is the church is, is just we've removed ourselves because we haven't stood up for ourselves or for God mm -hmm. in that matter. We want to be politically correct. We want to be seeker sensitive. We want our churches to grow. We don't want to offend anyone. But I think what Pastor Nathan said earlier when he was quoting from Romans chapter 8 where it says God works all things together for our mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. But if we finish that verse, it's for those who love him. 
who love him. If we want things to work together for our good, our tragedies, our sufferings, um, to make sense of senseless things, we have to show people how to love, how to fall in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you know, God, God is an expert at taking tragedy and bringing good out of it. But you know, God doesn't do it on his own. He uses people. And in this New Testament era, that, that's Christians that he's using. Would you say that's, that's the case? And, and we, have a, we have a prime opportunity with these tragedies right now to step forward. Yeah, you know, I, I've often pondered the same thing, Bill, and that is, why does it seem as if we are so slow to respond to some of these things? But I think, and, and the best answer I could come up with uh, is from the scripture, and, and I see that the bride of Christ is, is reactionary, and I think that's okay, uh, but sometimes we do get a bit lethargic. So while we're reactionary, I think we need to, to be on guard, be aware, and then when these situations arise, we have to mobilize with love, like you're saying, and, and be the presence of Jesus. And, I, and if we go back to what I'm calling the, uh, the Suffer's Handbook, the Book of Job, uh, we see that, that tragedy is not the time to discuss deep theological truths mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. to hurl accusations. Yes. I mean, if we look at Job, I mean, it taught us anything. <laughs> it taught us, man, when, when someone's in deep tragedy, you don't tell them they're a sinner because ultimately you don't know their heart, God does. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we can say is, you know what? I'm gonna walk with you, I'm gonna be with you. And then, you know, you provide them if they need any kind of physical support, you do that. But it, it, it's putting Jesus on like a robe and, and walking around and loving those whose hearts are hurting. And, and as we have pointed out around this table, we have a couple here that have gone through deep tragedy. You two are probably better equipped to deal with those type of situations because you've been through it. And the body of Christ, so many in the body of Christ can take their gift of mercy, what they've experienced, and then minister to the deepest parts of these hurting hearts yeah. that, that the world can't offer. You, you've referred to Joe a, num a number of times yes. during the course of our conversation. Would you say that as we look at Job with his personal tragedy, his physical tragedy, and the quote unquote three friends who came <laughs> to visit him and just were totally out of it, they just didn't know what he was dealing with really, but they thought they were being friendly. Is there a lesson for us to learn as Christians as we attempt to minister to people who are experiencing tragedy. Is there a lesson to learn? Yeah, I And think, what is it, if so? Yeah, I, I think the, the friends did themselves a favor in the first seven days, they just didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's probably the just, best sign. Right, and, and yeah. I like the term, the ministry of presence. I don't need to say anything, I just need to be there. They were at their best right then. They were at their best. And, and they got into trouble, really, when watch it, when mouth. they opened their mouths. <laughs> well, on the opposite side of, of suffering, um, I think we have to, as Christians, if people are trying to comfort us, we have to be willing to extend grace. I think, you know, people, when, when my husband was walking through, um, well, when our family was walking through this past 16 years with MS, people would say crazy things to us, like stupid things really? to us, really. Mm -hmm. I had, we had one man who came to us one day, Howard was having a very bad day, and he was crying, and he, was, he said to my husband, he said, um, I just want you to know, brother, I'm praying for you. Go back to the prayer. I'm praying for you, and I'm praying that if God doesn't heal you, he takes you from this life real soon. What? Okay, he really said that. But see, he was saying it with such sincerity yeah, that yeah. we have to be mature enough not to be offended when people say stupid things yeah, because that yeah. destroys a relationship too. You know, some of the other things people have said, you know, well, God must think you're pretty strong or God thinks you can handle it. Those are not the things to say no, to people, Christian no, or non-Christian, no. when we're walking through a strategy. So, or through a, through a tragedy, not a strategy, through a tragedy. So I think we have to be really cognizant and aware. You know, the people just, they do, they do their best to comfort us, but I think the degree of our spirituality is reflected by the degree of our offendability. And I do not <laughs> think as Christians we should be easily offended because that can also destroy our opportunities within mm -hmm. tragedies. Well, and I think you made a point there, like especially within these tragedies, you know, everybody that's lost somebody in these shootings, everybody that's lost anybody in their life, any major tragedy that they come, it is a misconception that you are strong enough to deal with it. Right. Because the fact is, is that if we were strong enough to deal with it, we wouldn't need God. Right. Mm -hmm. I am not strong enough to deal with any tragedy. Therefore, I need a savior to help me to deal with that tragedy. Yes. And that's what we need to point them to. And something, but the word would say you're using Christianity as a crutch. 
And I was well, like, absolutely, absolutely not. I, I was I absolutely, I am. <laughs> I know I can't do it on my own. I'm a human being. I bleed. I hurt. I cry. So absolutely, we all need help. What crutch are you using? Everyone uses a crutch, whether it's friends, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's your cell phone. Everyone uses something to help them cope with life. Absolutely, I'm using it as, as a crutch because he says when I am weak, he is strong. And so, you know, if my leg's not working, give me some crutches or I'm going to be sitting on my bottom on the floor. Yeah, you know see, I saying? go the other angle where I'm not using a crutch because I just know myself well enough. Mm -hmm. I know that the creator created me a certain way and right. I know my limitations. Mm -hmm. You know, call that using a crutch or not, but all of us have used a car to get thing. here. Absolutely. Yeah, the same things. thing, yeah. just. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, Different perspectives. Yeah. But to say that you don't need God, put yourself in place of God. Mm -hmm. Right. So I am not. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you probably were not. It was uh -uh. only by the grace of God yes. that we can deal with any of these tragedies. If you go back to Job, Job could not have come through that without God. Yeah. And he knew that. That's why he held strong against those friends when they opened their mouth. I know that I did not do wrong. I know that I am a righteous man before God. Mm -hmm. He did not say, I know I did not do wrong or, or I never did anything because I just know. He just knew who he was with God. Let, let, let's, let's bring this to, let's, let's kind of wrap this up. We're, we're nearing the end of our discussion. But as we move forward, one thing I want to say, I wish I didn't have to say it, but I don't think this tragedy is the last one. Mm. If history is any, is any indicator, this kind of a tragedy will happen again. And when will we learn? When will we move forward? What, what should we as the church be doing going forward to help those victims? And for us in Ohio, the, 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 the Dayton situation is right on our backyard, so to speak. And then there's El Paso, Texas. But what should we be doing to help now? How should we be preparing ourselves and other Christians to address these tragedies in the future. We live in a fallen world. This is going to happen again. I wish I didn't have to say that, but it's gonna happen again. How, how do we prepare? What think, do we do? I think the biggest answer to that question is we need to demonstrate as a church that there is hope, that there is something beyond this. And I think as we get down to the, the overarching issue and whether it's um, all the problems we've talked about with opiate addiction, with tragedy, um, a lot of people don't have hope and we unfortunately as, as churches have demonstrated that we are um, just like normal people except we spend an hour of our time in church on Sunday. Mm. We haven't demonstrated that we live by different values, by a different life, mm. and that's really what's needed by the church in the grand scheme of things, not necessarily even responding to tragedies, but for life going forward is to demonstrate that we do have that hope in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there is something different about us and about that life and to invite people into that hope. Um, which unfortunately the truth of it is a lot of our churches don't demonstrate. Bill, I think we could do quickly. two things. Yes, the first thing is a practical theology. Get the salt out of the shaker. Get out into the world. Love on people. And secondarily, pastors, all of us, equip your people to deal yes. with suffering. Teach them a good theology of suffering. It's coming. Jesus promised tribulation, but he's overcome the world. Right. And also to teach people to know how to say the right things and yeah. not dumb, stupid things as you would say exactly. when, when they're confronted with those. Exactly. Speak in a way that people will hear your message, not just listen to your words. Thank you very much. We're all out of time. I, I certainly hope this helps people that are dealing with tragedies and um, we just pray. Let's continue to pray. That, that's not a weakness. There's no distance in prayer. But as, as well, we want to roll up our sleeves and go to work. Thank you for joining us on our program today. We will be joined again by this panel next week to discuss some other issues. This we took the whole show for, <laughs> and for obvious reasons. But we'll be back to answer some of your questions again next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. 
Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.